guys, so first things first, I am going to mention the fact that the audio is sound the same as the previous video, which it actually didn't sound all that bad, which is why I didn't really bother re-hooking up my microphone. Um, second off, I do want to mention, next week though, there will not be a video. I film and edit my videos on Thursdays every week. Next Thursday happens to be Parzival's surgery. So he's going to be gone all day, and I'm going to utilize that time to show my cat that I still actually love him because he's really depressed because so much of my attention is divided in and I pay so much attention to Parzival right now. With that being said, this video topic is actually something I started talking about in one of my previous streams the other day. Um, I did start streaming on Twitch, as I said in my previous video, 1 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I'm aiming for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Fridays. I might pick up some, like, Saturdays. Um, I'm gonna try to avoid Thursdays so I can do this. Honestly, I'm really enjoying it, strictly because I'm just working on animation, which is what I do on a normal basis, but I get to talk to people. It's literally the only way I'm fueling my social battery right now, because, unfortunately, I am a human being, and I am a social creature. Unfortunately. So, I need you guys to help me, so that way I don't go completely insane, okay? Bradley's great and all, I can talk to him whenever I, I need to, pretty much, but he's only one person. It'd be nice to have a little bit of different topics to talk about, okay? One at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time on Twitch. I have the same name as I do on YouTube and the links in the description below. Go check it out. I have a lot of fun just doing what I do and I hope you guys would enjoy dropping in every once in a while too. Anyway, so this video might actually bring up some controversy, I guess? Because when I was streaming, I started talking about the movie Tarzan. Disney's Tarzan. The other day when I was driving home, I was listening to a playlist that I had started off of the soundtrack of Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron, and apparently that playlist decided to play Trashing the Camp from Tarzan. After listening to that, to that song, I suddenly wanted to watch Tarzan. Because it's from that movie. Makes sense, right? Never did get around to watching it, though, and I started talking about it on the stream, and it got me on the topic of what I actually think the golden era of Disney was. Now, it's definitely not anything recently, because all Disney is is a greedy hag that wants their greedy little hands on everything. And in my opinion, it also wasn't the Disney Renaissance. Every movie was exactly the same. They fall in love, they sing a song, they get the happy ending. Ooh, wow. Now, I understand that most Disney movies end with a happy ending, and that's kind of the Disney format. And the era that I'm going to be talking about, the post-Renaissance, they kind of end the same way, too. And yes, I'm looking at my viewfinder and not the lens. I'm trying to fix that, but I, 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 I can't figure it out, I guess. <laughs> but in my opinion, the post-Renaissance era was actually the golden age of Disney. The Renaissance era was great, and they really did have a couple of breakthroughs, as far as Beauty and the Beast being as beautiful as it was. Aladdin was Oscar-winning, as far as part of your world. Great. But from a writing, an animating, just all-around creative standpoint, the post-Renaissance is where Disney was thriving. Now, I'm not sure if I actually have the Disney eras all lined up, as far as I'm aware. The Disney Renaissance kind of ended in 99, 2000, so everything in the early 2000s is kind of the post-Renaissance era, and then it comes to, what, Princess and the Frog, and that's kind of the era we're in now, I, I think? Because Princess and the Frog was kind of where they started going back to the Disney Princess thing, and then we got Tangled, we got Frozen, we got Raya, we got Encanto. So, did I say that right? Encanto, right? Or is... Because it's not Encanto. I'm thinking way too much about this. <laughs> anyway, my ADHD isn't as bad as it was last video, but it's still pretty bad. I mean, every day's pretty bad, so... <laughs> so, in my head, I tell myself that the Disney's post-Renaissance starts around, like, 2000, or I guess 1999, because Tarzan is a part of the post-Renaissance. What year was? What year was 9-11? Dear Lord. Disney's Tarzan. I'm pretty sure it was 99. It is. June 18th, 1999 was Tarzan. So I guess the post-Renaissance era started in 1999 with Tarzan because I feel like people, um, I'll get to that actually. I want to talk about just in specifics like what films I want to talk about. So Tarzan was where it kind of started, at least in my mind. And then there were films. I think the next one would have been Brother Bear 
phenomenal film, didn't need a sequel, but still a phenomenal film. Then you had Meet the Robinsons, you had Lilo and Stitch, and you had Treasure Planet. Those are kind of the movies that I remember from this era that really resonated with me as a child, and even some of them still to this day, for their own reasons, and I'll get to that. The reason I think that Disney's post-Renaissance era goes under the radar is because they stopped doing musicals, which is not a bad thing. One of the movies I forgot to mention was Emperor's New Groove. Emperor's New Groove was originally supposed to be a musical, and apparently a bunch of people were kind of disappointed that the lady who voiced Yzma, whom I don't know her name, I don't really know her as an actress either, so I don't know what she could sing or not, but apparently her audio for her villain song for Emperor's New Groove is somewhere floating around the internet, and apparently it's phenomenal, and people were really disappointed that we didn't get that. And that's totally fine, because we were given that, and we didn't get it in full form. It's okay to want more. That's totally fine, and I understand where you're coming from, but we can't let what we didn't get undermine what we did. Emperor's New Groove is a phenomenal buddy film. Like, I think the characters are really well written, not to mention the voiceover of David Spade and John Goodman worked really well together. They had so much chemistry, and I think that, I think, I think that movie stands out just because of the casting. And yeah, you could argue, oh, celebrity cast, whatever, but the casting worked. Other films that I think about, like, the casting just working is like The Greatest Showman. I don't think that movie would have worked as well as it did if they didn't have the performers that they did. Zac Efron is one phenomenal at singing, even though he didn't sing in the first High School Musical, but also he's a phenomenal dancer. Same thing with Zendaya. Um, and don't even get me started on the endless talent that is Hugh Jackman, okay? Now, I remember the first time I heard Hugh Jackman sing was in Les Mis, and I wasn't impressed. And then I found out that in Les Mis, they didn't pre-record anything. Everything was sang on set, which I think hurt it more than helped it. But I'm getting off topic. Anyway, Emperor's New Groove is one of those films that just kind of works because of the cast. Now, I can understand why we would want a musical out of it, because we have a taste of what we didn't get. But then we get on the topic of Tarzan. Tarzan is technically a musical, I, I think, because the music helps carry the film. So that makes it a musical, right? Anyway, the big thing that drives me insane that a lot of people have an issue with Tarzan is the fact that Tarzan doesn't sing. And looking back on the film that I remember as a child, I really can't imagine Tarzan singing. For one, Tarzan is an ape man. He doesn't even know what singing is. Now, I understand it's a cartoon and it's just a stupid story, so you could have written it whatever you wanted and... Sure. But why do people hate Phil Collins so much? I... even Bradley! Bradley and I have talked about it. Bradley doesn't like Phil Collins. He says he doesn't like his voice, which, fair enough, he does have a very, very distinct voice that I can pinpoint out of anywhere. And it's a voice that Bradley doesn't like. And that's fine. But looking at it as a whole, not just Phil Collins as far as vocals, but also the score and soundtrack itself in Tarzan, I think is phenomenal, and I think it was incorporated really well. And yeah, people wanted Tarzan to sing because that's what they're used to getting from Disney, but is it really a bad thing for someone to want to try something different and it succeeds? I mean, look at what the Pokemon franchise did. The Pokemon franchise, all of the games, have been exactly the same since... 1950! That's a really long time ago. I don't think that's the year I'm looking for, but that's the year I'm rolling with. Let me know. Let me know. I don't want to Google it. I'm too lazy. So let me know what year Pokemon actually started. I think it was the 90s, actually. I just said 1950. Pokemon games have all had the same format and the same setup, except if you're not counting the spin-off games, like Detective Pikachu and Pokemon Snap and things like that. But the base Pokemon games, Pokemon Red, Pokemon... Uh, God, I can't remember. I can't remember what the other one with red was. Or was it just Pokemon Red? But then you've got Diamond and Pearl and Sapphire and Ruby and they're all exactly the same. And now we have Legends of Arceus. And let me tell you, I don't buy games at full price. Ever. Because with some exceptions. I did pre-order Kingdom Hearts 3 because I was as excited as I was for it. Um, Bradley ended up getting me the uh, Switch version of Tie the Tasmanian Tiger at full price. 
because it was Christmas time and that was when it came out and he paid full price then. But aside from that, like, we, we try to avoid buying games at full price. When Legends of Arceus was announced, Bradley told me, I'm gonna go get it and I am willing to pay full price for it. And I'm like, for a Pokemon game, like, who are you and what have you done to Bradley? Well, little did I know that they changed the format of the gameplay. And when he sat down and played it, and I'm watching it, it looks so engaging. Because the movement in battle is phenom- like, that right there is what makes it phenomenal. It makes you feel more in the shoes of that character. So change can be good, and this world is really failing to understand that right now. On the topic of Phil Collins, another film that was released in the post-Renaissance era of Disney was Brother Bear, which also had the soundtrack by Phil Collins, and I and the opening number is performed by some other group, I think, or maybe some other lady or man, or I, I, I don't know, but the opening isn't sang by Phil Collins, but Phil Collins does have a version of his own of the opening song, Great Spirits. I think it's called Great Spirits. Such an amazing song, such a beautiful song, and with the, like, honestly, in this case, I prefer the one from the film, the opening song from the film, rather than Phil Collins' version, because the chorus just melt. <laughs> it's a really phenomenal opening, and then even when you get to the Phil Collins stuff, it's still really great too. I'm On My Way is a stupid catchy song, it kind of, it's, you know, the montage song to help progress the traveling and all that fun stuff, but then you have No Way Out. I think that's what it's called, but it's the song, spoilers, by the way, if you don't want spoilers, click off now. Bye! So it's the song that plays when Kenai realizes that he was the one who killed Koda's mother. So there's all this tension that you can feel as Kenai is talking to Koda, because Koda's just a kid. I mean, Koda's a kid. You can't just straight up say, your mom died because of me. So there's this tension while they're talking, and at this point in the film, they actually muted the dialogue and just added lip syncing to the characters. And then Phil Collins starts singing his song, and not to mention the score that goes with it, it all meshes together so nicely. And the impact of the score, not so much just Phil Collins, but the score, when Coda finally put the pieces together, beauty. Like, musically, creative, and beautiful. And it, it neither of the characters were singing. Now, another thing that I've heard people complain about Brother Bear is the fact that Coda starts singing one of the songs, I'm on my way, and then stops for Phil Collins to take over. Let's be honest, do we really want the kid who voiced Coda to sing the entire I'm on my way song? Is that really what we want? Back then, is it really what we wanted? I'm gonna say not me. Because, I mean, he was a kid who voiced Coda. So, I didn't think he could carry the song as well as Phil Collins. And, in my opinion, if you're going to make a musical, the cast has to be able to sing, and sing well. And, I don't think that kid could have in my opinion. Now, when I was a kid, another film that resonated with me was Meet the Robinsons, and it was just kind of an all-around feel-good story. Um, I really liked the characters, and even some of the minor characters, they had, like, enough screen time that they were just about to get annoying, but they had just enough development, too, where you kind of just got to know the family, and, you know, it was a wacky family, and that's what they were going for. Also, fun fact, William Joyce was actually the one who wrote the book that Meet the Robinsons is based off of. I don't think it's called Meet the Robinsons. I think it's called The Robinson Family and the Time Machine. I think? But he's the same guy who wrote The Guardians of Childhood, which is what the DreamWorks Rise of the Guardians is based off of, and he wrote uh, Mary Catherine and the Leafman, I think is what it's called, which is what the movie, what Blue Sky's epic is based off of. That was off topic, but I wanted to share that fact. 
anyway, Meet the Robinsons is a pretty feel-good story, and I remember that's what I liked about it. I liked the characters, I liked the story. Looking back at it now, it doesn't resonate with me as much, and I think a lot of it has to do with how, like, the animation didn't age too well. Um, and that's okay because of the time period that it came out. 3D animation was still kind of being learned, like, look back at the first Toy Story. I mean, that didn't age well either. I mean, I sometimes argue that the first How to Train Your Dragon didn't age well, and that was 2010. So, like, animation has come a really long way, so I don't, I try not to hold anything against the film if the animation didn't age well, because it wasn't something that they could, there wasn't anything that they could do about it. But, it is something that puts up a barrier for me, is what I'm saying. But still, Meet the Robinsons is still a pretty special film, deep down. It, there's a bit of a barrier in between us now, but I still think it's something special. Now, there's a couple of films that I think came out in this time that are severely underrated, and everybody talks about how underrated they are. And to this day, these films are so, so special to me. And those films are Atlantis and Treasure Planet. Atlantis is one of D Bradley's favorite films of all time. I think this is another one where the cast does a lot for it. Uh, but the characters are very well written. Even the side characters, like Audrey and uh, Sweet and uh, Cookie, like they all have their own like character, um, and they share a little bit of their backstory to help develop them further. And their actions during the climax make sense as of who they are. And also, it's like beautifully animated. Like there is. As far as I'm aware, there's nothing CGI in the film. I think it is all 2D animation, which is something that I need to appreciate in this era because 3D was taking over as much as it was. Now, you could argue that that's why Atlantis was a box office bust, but that's beside the point. It's all 2D animation, and I think we need to appreciate that for what it is. Um, and it's so, so creative taking a myth that people have heard before of the lost city of Atlantis and working off that. Like, and now Disney has done that for so long. I mean, look at Cinderella and Snow White, what they did with them. Air, uh, Ariel, um, The Little Mermaid. The Little Mermaid was originally Hans Christian Andersen. And I think at the end she turns into sea foam because that's the deal she made with the sea witch and she didn't actually get the guy at the end but Disney took that story and made it their own but I, I don't know what makes Atlantis special to me I think it's because I've heard of Atlantis before I had seen that movie and I remember as a kid I couldn't get enough of it like I watched it on repeat speaking of watching on repeat <laughs> Let's talk about Treasure Planet, because I could not get enough of that film. I remember, even as a child, there was something about the animation in Treasure Planet that stood out to me. Now, did I know it was the animation that stood out to me? No. But there was something, it was something there that just was amazing to me. And I, like I said, as a child, I didn't know what it was. But I loved this movie. I could watch it on repeat. And I did watch it on repeat. And now, as time has gone on, and I'm learning about animation, and I'm looking back on some of these films, I learned that uh, Treasure Planet is hybrid animated. They have 3D models attached to 2D. Like, that right there there as someone who's playing around with both 3D and 2D animation I, I I I don't understand I can't comprehend how you put a 3D model into a 2D environment and make it work like or do you put the 2D model into the 3D environment and make it work I don't know I still don't know but now like after finding that out it is so much more special to me not to mention, like, the hybrid animated character, Silver, oh my god, his character arc. His character arc really reminds me of, like, Zuko, almost, in Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, obviously in a film you have less time to help it progress and everything, but I think they did really well as far as making it work in a short period of time. You know, he wasn't exact he wasn't exactly a villain to the protagonist, but he was a he was the antagonist of 
the film, but he has an overall arch where he is better come the end. He makes the right choices and it makes sense why he makes those choices. And uh, I've heard people complain about the fact that the supporting characters in the film don't have enough development. And yeah, you could argue that, but the film wasn't about them. The film was about Jim and Silver. That's where the story was. The story was Jim who didn't have his father anymore and Silver who was filling that void for him. So Treasure Planet is a film that was always special to me as a child, and as time went on, it became something more special to me. Parzival! <laughs> now, I might be biased when I say that, because if you guys, if I've never mentioned it before, I'm going to mention it now, I am a sucker for pirates. Like, I'm one of those people who kind of romanticizes the pirate culture and things like that. It's just something so fascinating to me. It always has been. Um, I feel kind of the same uh, towards Brother Bear in the same way because I'm really fascinated with like that, um, I, I, I don't want to call it Native American culture. Um, because I, I, I can't remember the word. Indigenous culture? Aboriginal culture? Inuit culture, I think it's Inuit, I can't remember the word, but I'm really fascinated with that culture too. But I am a sucker for pirates. And, if I haven't mentioned this before, I have always been a sucker for astronomy as well. Or astrology. The study of stars in space, nothing to do with the zodiacs, just, like, I loved learning all the planets. Like, looking at the satellite pictures of them, like, I think space is beautiful. So, Treasure Planet was made for me, okay? And I cannot get enough of it. I'm starting to gush now. <laughs> Just pirates in space. Who came up with that? And like, this is Disney we're talking about. Disney who is so creatively bankrupt. They're buying out other properties, Blue Sky, Marvel, Studio Ghibli, just to make it seem like there's someone creative in their, under their ranks, but there's not. They're not creative at all anymore. How in the world is this company that has nothing to do, that doesn't want anything to do with anything other than money, spat out something so creative as pirates in space? Somebody needs to answer this. Okay. Somebody needs to answer this for me because I got really worked up there. We're gonna really test out this camera's microphone today, I guess. But anyway, like I said, I talked about this on a stream a couple of days ago. If you did drop in there, you might have heard me repeat some of the things, but I feel like when I'm, like, since I'm so new to streaming, I can't get my thoughts together very well, so I can sit down and edit my thoughts together in this format. So make sure that if you're watching me stream and you ask me something, take what I say it with a grain of, with a grain of salt, because I might come back here and more articulate what I'm trying to say, because when I'm put on the spot, I don't have enough time to think, and when, fun fact about ADHD, my mouth normally says something before my brain has time to comprehend what I'm saying. And yes, that's me blaming my ADHD, but just know that that is something that happens with me. And it might not be ADHD. I, it might just be my brain the way it's wired. But anyway guys, that's it for this video. I need to go take Puppy for a walk. Thank you guys for watching this video, and thank you anybody who's been dropping in on my Twitch streams. Links to subscribe and links to my Twitch channel will be in the description below. They'll always be there for you. But for now, bye guys. So I need your guys' help so I don't go... Parzival. <laughs> he knocked into my tripod. It's a really phenomenal, it's a really phenomenal opening, but then when you get to the Phil Collins stuff, um, hey, Parzival, no.